Good afternoon, everybody. It's Dr. Galvin with a coronavirus update today. It is Wednesday, June 10th, and we're going to talk about a few things today. If you haven't joined us before, my name is Jeffrey Galvin. I'm a physician. I'm a board-certified emergency physician and continue to work in the emergency department. I also run a functional medicine practice in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we function. We work on uh, reversing chronic disease. We do things like hormone therapy, performance optimization, weight loss, and reversal of chronic disease. I've been doing virus updates since the pandemic started, and we're gonna talk a little bit about numbers today. I've been alluding to the fact that we're gonna talk a little bit about whether this virus may actually be a vascular disease, um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that. We're also gonna to talk today a little bit about some of the big case spikes we've been seeing that are probably related to many states opening things up a few weeks ago. We're gonna talk a little bit about the effect that the protests on numbers and what, what effects they may have. Um, and then we're gonna talk about these vascular effects that may explain some of the strange symptoms that we see in some of these COVID patients, especially the sicker ones, and it may also explain why there's a predilection for people that have certain underlying medical conditions to get sicker with this disease. First off, the number 7.2 million cases worldwide, 411,000 deaths, 3.4 million recoveries here in the U.S. We've crossed the 2 million threshold. We've had 2 million plus confirmed cases, 114,000 deaths, 604,000 recoveries here in my state of North Carolina. We've crossed 38,000 cases, um, over 1,000 deaths, 1,053. And unfortunately, we've been having massive spikes in cases, triple digit increases for the last 12 days. We opened up our, our state um, in phase two on May 22nd. And since that time, we've unfortunately been seeing very big spikes in cases. And that unfortunately is being repeated now. I believe there are 22, um, no, 21 states with rising numbers of cases. And almost all of those states are states that have gone to phase two reopening. And is that surprising? Not, not really. If, if we release restrictions, more people are gonna come in contact with the virus and we're gonna see increasing number of cases. Now, we're also increasing testing, so we would expect to see more positive cases. So probably the number to really look at are hospitalization rates because you know, hospitalization is not really related to to testing, right? It, it's related to people getting sick and needing to be hospitalized. So it's irrelevant of testing. But unfortunately, what we're seeing is increasing our numbers of hospitalizations here in North Carolina. On, on the 22nd, the day that we opened up phase two, there were 522 hospitalizations in the state. Today, there are 780. So hospitalizations are significantly higher than when we opened up. In Arizona, they're actually looking at a crisis. They're having you know massive numbers of cases, a lot of people on ventilators, big numbers of increases in um, ventilated and critical care patients. So we've got to take a look at that. What do the protests mean? Well, you know, the protests, we've got tons of people together. We're already seeing positive cases as a result of the protests. Um, I think if you're in a protest, you have to assume that you were exposed. And you know, if you were exposed, you probably need to self-quarantine because testing's probably not enough. Um, you have to make an assumption that you were exposed and you may well expose other people. And we're not gonna see the results of those protests for several weeks. So I understand the need to protest and I understand the underlying causes, but please be aware that if you were protesting, you may well have been exposed and you may expose people that are at high risk. Um, you know, we were just at the beach. Um, we took a family vacation there this weekend and, and the place was packed. Um, I think, you know, I was asked by a number of people, do you I think the beach is safe? I think the beach is actually pretty safe. You know, you, you're out on the beach, there's lots of, of space available between people. We've talked about the fact that, you know, infection is related to exposure plus time. And if there's a lot of air movement around you, then your exposure is really, really limited. And as long as you're not in close proximity to people, I, I think it's pretty safe. So there were lots and lots of people at the beach, but I thought that people were taking pretty reasonable precautions. People were wearing masks inside stores. Um, when when uh, my family was out on the beach, we weren't really close to other people. and. I thought it was actually pretty safe. I, I, and uh, I was talking to some of the business owners there. They said that their businesses were booming, that, that they were seeing a huge number of people and there was lots of traffic there. And I, I thought it was pretty safe. And you know, we've got to think about mental health and, and physical health, they go hand in hand. And I think if you want to get out there, um, I think it can be done safely. You just need to be smart, avoid crowds, you know, take the, you know, 
personal separation is a big thing. Avoid close proximity to other people for a prolonged period of time. Avoid situations where you're gonna get exposed to coughing or yelling or, or um, uh, in closed spaces, especially indoors, uh, outside, I think you're gonna be safe. Now, I wanna talk about whether or not, you know, we, we think about you know, respiratory exposure as a way of getting this disease, and we think it's a respiratory disease, but many of the symptoms we're seeing in people are actually vascular symptoms. And, you know, we've seen these people that come in with these very low oxygen saturations, which is very unusual, even though they don't seem to be in extremis in terms of the respiratory status sometimes. We're also seeing people with blood clots. We're seeing people that are having heart attacks and strokes related to COVID, and if it's a respiratory disease, you wouldn't expect to see these types of, of symptoms in these patients. And we know that about 40% of the people that are dying from COVID are actually dying from cardiovascular complications of the disease, and that's very unusual. And there have been a number of papers recently that have pointed out that it looks like there are these vascular complications from the disease. So what does that mean? We also know that there's association between the people who are getting sick and dying with COVID and hypertension and diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So what is going on here? And we're, we're discovering that we think the virus may be able to make the jump from respiratory cells to endothelial cells. Now, what are endothelial cells? Endothelial cells are these cells that line all of our blood vessels. And you know, blood vessels go everywhere in our, in our body, and they're very, very important. Um, they're is a, a receptor called an ACE2 receptor. We think that the, the virus binds to these ACE2 receptors in pulmonary tissue, and that's how it kind of gets in there. Um, there is a, uh, an enzyme that basically has to, to, to break open this, the, the virus to let it infect. In SARS-1, the, the enzyme that, was a, uh, that broke this virus was only in lung tissue, and so it was limited to lung tissue. Well, we think the enzyme that may break open the virus um, for SARS-CoV-2 may be this, this enzyme called furin, and that's in all cells, and so that's a problem. And it's found in endothelial cells too, so we think that the virus can actually, once it sort of destroys lung tissue, can actually get into the endothelial cells and infect those cells as well, and then it can get everywhere in the body. There's a thing called endothelial dysfunction that we think is the root cause of heart disease and strokes. And, you know, in my wellness practice, we are, you know, we do a lot of very careful monitoring of people and screening of people for very early signs of heart disease. And we do things like coronary calcium scores and advanced lab work to determine very early on whether people are at risk for heart disease. And we've found that we can detect heart disease decades before it ever shows itself by looking at these very advanced testing and we can identify people are at risk of, of sudden cardiac death a decade before it ever occurs. And when we identify it, we can actually prevent it. And what we're thinking is happening is that these endothelial cells are getting attacked. And if people have underlying heart disease and they've underlying perhaps endothelial plaque, those plaques can rupture, they can, you know, clots can form and you get under, you know, suddenly you have a stroke or a heart attack that's triggered by this infection as opposed to endothelial dysfunction related to diabetes or hypertension or underlying um, other diseases. Um, you can get microemboli that can go out and, and cause peripheral clots, and we think that that may play a role in some of the side effects and some of the, the um, sequelae that we're seeing in these very, very sick patients that are dying on ventilators and, and um, other problems that we're seeing with um, some of the strokes and um, primary cardiac problems that we're seeing in these end-stage uh, COVID patients. And there's an interesting sort of question that's raised that if this is actually an endothelial disease, then maybe things like antivirals are not really the treatment. Maybe it's using things like blood thinners or things like statins and you know perhaps ACE inhibitors or other things that we would use if we found out people had endothelial dysfunction or diabetes or existing plaque. Um, maybe those are the drugs that we need to use for people that have COVID 
because if we can reverse that root cause. So if we have a person that, for example, has intrinsic cardiac disease, maybe they've got a positive calcium score and they've got high levels of inflammation and we know that they've got underlying plaque, well, if we put that person on a statin, what we can do is we can stabilize that plaque, we can prevent it from rupturing, we can lower C-reactive protein, and we can prevent that sudden cardiac death. Well, if we've got an accelerated process because this virus has inflamed that plaque and they're at risk of rupturing, maybe those same, that same regimen that we do to prevent sudden cardiac death in people who are healthy, that same regimen may be protective in folks that have COVID. And there was a study that looked at 9,000 patients or so that were on statins and ACE inhibitors and they had lower mortality in, um, than those that were, were not on those medicines um, in severe COVID. And so it really raises some interesting questions that we might have some other avenues for treatment in these patients that have really severe COVID. And there may be some regimens that we can use that people People that have these underlying problems of heart disease, of hypertension, of diabetes, of underlying cardiovascular disease, if they develop COVID, we may want to aggressively treat those underlying problems as a way of preventing those people from developing the more severe sequelae of COVID. Again, our understanding of this disease is changing on a daily basis. And so, you know, we're learning as we go. And, it got, you know, I understand how it's frustrating. I get it. But that's the way science works. And, you know, the scientific method is that we come up with a hypothesis, right? And you know what a hypothesis is? It's a guess. It may be an educated guess, but it's a guess nonetheless. And we, we have these guesses, these hypotheses, and then we, we come up with an experiment to test it. And if the experiment disproves the guess, then it's wrong. And we have to say, okay, well, that was wrong. Let's come up with another guess and we test that. And so, you know, science is littered with hypotheses that have been disproved. It, it doesn't mean that there's a conspiracy. It doesn't mean that people are trying to, to hurt people. It means that we're going through this process in order to find the right answers. And, and along the way, we're going, to have mis we're going to make mistakes, we're going to make wrong guesses. But ultimately, we, we get to the right answers by making mistakes along the way. And that is the scientific method. It's not clean, it's not quick. And that's why you're going to see papers that get published, they get retracted, they get disproven. That's why people are, that's why there's peer review, that's why people debate these things. And that's why what we thought was true two months ago is now now we have different ideas because these things are, are sort of put out there smart people debate them and and things get proven or disproven and new ideas are put out there and at the end of the day we get closer and closer to the truth and we learn more day after day so you know understand the scientific process. No one is trying to hurt anybody. We're trying to get to the truth. We're trying to, to take the best care possible we can for everybody um, and understand that it's it's an imperfect process and we're, we're doing our best. That's what enough for today. Um, we're, we've got a, an ongoing uh, wellness uh, topic we talked about uh, or I talked about on Monday, um, the weight loss and all the, the reasons that it's difficult to lose weight. So if, if that's something you're interested in, go back and watch the video on Monday. We are going to be going through all those points over the next couple weeks. Um, and that's the first set of wellness topics. Um, I think we're going to be uh, doing a discussion with another doctor or two uh, coming up. I think I'm going to have Dr. Hogenkamp back on. We may do it as a Facebook Live. I'm not sure. It gets a little chaotic with those Facebook Lives. So put in your comments whether you like that or not. Um, and maybe I might just solicit questions and then Dr. Hogan Camp and I can just answer those. Maybe that's a little bit more organized. I don't know. Put your questions and your topics below and we'll sort of see um, what people feel like is a good idea. Um, as usual, if you find this useful, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, follow us on Facebook. As usual, wash your hands. Take care of yourselves. Take care of your families. Look out for everybody around you. I'll be back soon. Have a great day. Talk to you soon. Bye.